Hey y'all, my name is Adina Barnett Miller, but I'm known to my students as Mrs. B. I've been passionate about West Virginia history for as long as I can remember, but my mom would tell you it all started when I was three years old and she bought me a West Virginia County's puzzle at Geno's Pizza. I've taught history in Ripley, West Virginia for over 20 years now, and I'm an adjunct professor who teaches college West Virginia history to high school students. Please join me for West Virginia History with Mrs. B, a field trip across the mountain state to walk in the footsteps of those who came before us. Hey y'all, it's West Virginia History with Mrs. B, and we are today in Wheeling, West Virginia at what is called West Virginia Independence Hall. Uh, the original building's uh, purpose was the U.S. Custom House here in Wheeling, which is in Ohio County. Um, when we talk about West Virginia and we talk about sacred spaces, this is one of the most sacred spaces in all of West Virginia because this is the building of the actual convention that created the state of West Virginia during the Civil War. So this is a historical image. Um, it was a lithograph of this building and you can see it shows all kinds of folks gathered around the building. And so this was actually in um, Harper's Weekly in 1863, this image was, and this is showing and depicting um, finding out that we get final passage for West Virginia statehood. So Lincoln gave West Virginia the thumbs up on April the 20th, 1863, and he said in 60 days, uh, the state of West Virginia will become a state. And so this is the gathering that happened here in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, Virginia at the time, um, to acknowledge that and to celebrate that they had gone through all of the constitutional steps that were required for West Virginia to become a state. I'm gonna show you a lot of cool pictures down here. This is the basement of the building. <laughs> but they have all kinds of really great stuff down here. They have this historical rendering of this building. Uh, the building was originally the U.S. Customs House. It also, um, in the top floor, the third floor, uh, held uh, the federal courthouse, so the federal uh, judge for West Virginia for this district. Uh, his office was here. The post office for the city of Wheeling was also located in this building, so it had a lot of important purposes for the city of Wheeling, and it also had the largest space where the convention could be held. So they're going to move the convention from Washington Hall, which is going to serve as the first capital eventually, um, to this building. And Francis Pierpont, the first governor of the restored state of Virginia, um, he is going to have his office in this building as well, and we will show you that later on the tour. So we have all kinds of different images of this building located here on Market Street in Wheeling, and so you can see the building decorated at different times. And so what ends up happening is this building is going to eventually not be um, the uh, U.S. Customs House any longer and so it'll become privately owned and it will become in disrepair. It looks like a car wreck happened here. This is in 1925 of the building um, and then here's some other pictures of this building you know being used for businesses after it was given up by uh, the U.S. government. Here is a historical rendering of the building i mean it's a beautiful space and you can see here it was only two years old when uh the civil war broke out and uh the state of west virginia and the country were at war i love this this is before there were paved streets so you can see it's pretty muddy on this corner here's another historical image as well you see they have the telegraph wires right there running. And then this is a great picture of what the front looks like today. This is a statue we'll show you later of Francis Pierpont, the first governor of the restored state of Virginia that was loyal to the Union. And then here's another modern image of the building as well. Okay. And then this is another picture of the building. Um, this is in its current state, what it looks like. So we're gonna take you out in the hallway. We're gonna show you the images of all of the people 
who served on the convention who served in, on the in the convention these are the faces these are you know our patriots our west virginia patriots who served so this is james evans of montegalia county he's going to be in the first and second wheeling conventions granville davison hall so not only is he a reporter for the wheeling intelligencer he's going to write the book like the first book on this, the creation of the state of west virginia it was published in 1908 it's called the rending of west virginia um, by the way, I have a first edition copy of it at our house. It's very, very cool. So, um, Granville Parker, Chester Hubbard, Josiah Simmons, George Porter of Hancock County, John Dill, Spencer Dayton of Barber County. So, first and second willing. Oh, here's Peter Van Winkle. He was very, very important. Peter Van Winkle um, will be important in the Constitutional Convention. He also is going to be one of, the, one of the first of the first two U.S. senators from West Virginia, and it notes he voted against impeaching Andrew Johnson. Remember that vote for impeaching Andrew Johnson was only one vote. <laughs> so here's John J. Jackson of Wood County. Um, he's also going to be at the Richmond Convention, the secession convention that happened in 1861. He voted against secession. He'll attend the first Wheeling Convention. Here's John Atkinson. Oh, Gordon Battelle, important guy. He was proposed several amendments addressing the ending of slavery in West Virginia. He was a United Methodist minister. So there's actually gonna be a lot of ministers uh, who were involved in this movement. Here's Daniel Polesley, Jacob Beeson Blair, who also uh, played a real pro prominent role. He's gonna be one of the congressmen uh, of the, for, uh, before the outbreak of the Civil War, and then he'll be reelected. Gibson Kramer, Joseph Snyder, George Arnold of Lewis County, um, George W. Summers. Summers County is named for this guy, only Summers County in the United States. He is, he was in the Virginia General Assembly. He was in the U.S. House of Representatives, delegate to the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1850, ran for governor in 1851. He, after Lincoln's election, he participated in the Peace Conference. He represented Kanawha County at the Richmond Convention where he voted against secession. Here's Andrew Wilson. Campbell Tar. We'll keep going. We got the door. Here's Peter Lashley. He was also a minister as well. This is William Stevenson. He will be the third governor of West Virginia in 1869. Here's Daniel Johnson of Tyler County. He was even in the Union Army as a colonel in the 14th West Virginia in Infantry. Here's Daniel Lamb. Here is Henry Deering, Thomas Logan. Oh, Daniel D.T. Farnsworth, who will be also be a future governor of West Virginia for a whole nine days. Um, his house is in Buchanan, it's called the Governor's Inn. Um, but he was very active, not only in the statehood movement, but in the early governments of West Virginia. That's Joseph Wheat, Kelly and Whaley, J. Edgar Boyers of Tyler County. He's going to be the first Secretary of State of Virginia, West Virginia. Here's Peter Hale, Thomas Harrison. Note all the epic beards of the 1860s if you haven't already. Here's John Burdett of Taylor County. He was at the Richmond Convention and voted against secession, attended first and second wheeling conventions. He's later going to be in the state system, state senate, and he'll be treasurer of the state of West Virginia. Here's Lucian Higgins. He was secretary of the Commonwealth of the Reorganized Government of Virginia, or what I call the Restored State of Virginia, which was loyal to the uh, Union. Here's one of my favorite people, Archibald Campbell. He was the editor of the Willing Intelligence or newspaper. He was a big Lincolnite, even in 1860. And he, was, he really like pushed for Lincoln. He was a Lincoln lover. Um, and he was a huge proponent of the statehood movement and used the um, newspaper very, very much to get people to buy into the statehood movement. So um, also he's a nephew of Alexander Campbell who was the founder of Bethany College. This is Sylvanius Hall of Marion County. He'll be the clerk of the Constitutional Convention. He's also gonna be on the Supreme Court. 
James McGrew of Preston County. He's going to be in the legislature and he'll serve in Congress as well. I knew he sounded familiar. Here's John J. Brown of Preston County. He's also going to be in the state Senate as well. Here's Judge John J. Jackson of Wood County, son of General John J. Jackson. He'll also be a federal judge in this courthouse. Here's J.M. McWhorter of Roan County. He's going to be a circuit judge in our circuit where we live here in Jackson. Um, this is jo John Vance of Harrison County, James Bowner of Monongalia County. He'll be a paymaster in the Union Army and in the House of Delegates. Here's John J. Davis of Harrison County. He's also going to be in the House of Delegates. James H. Brown of Kanawha County. He's also going to be a judge on the Supreme Court of West Virginia. Here's Felix Sutton. Uh, here is John Witcher of Cabell County. He's going to uh, be in the 3rd West Virginia Cavalry and fight for the restored state of Virginia. He was part of the group that escorted General Grant to Appomattox Courthouse at the end of the war when Lee surrendered. Here's William G. Brown. He's going to be in the U.S. House of Representatives before the Civil War. He'll go to the Constitutional Convention in Richmond in 1850. And he also will be a congressman. Okay, so this next gentleman is Joseph H. Distabar. He's from Dardridge County. He was a French immigrant. He's going to be a de delegate to the restored government of Virginia. He's going to be in the state legislature. The reason why he's so important, we could talk about him all day, is he's not only going to be the guy who designs both the front and the back of the West Virginia state seal, but he also is going to be the commissioner of immigration for West Virginia. My students always ask, like, how did all these immigrants know to come to West Virginia? It was this guy right here, Distabar. He went out and he heavily recruited immigrants from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, actually all over Europe, to come to West Virginia um, to settle and to work in the coal industry, to work in the timber industry, uh, to work in the oil and natural gas industry. And so you could talk about this guy all day, but I mean, what a heritage to have. You create the seal of West Virginia and you create what West Virginia really looks like. This is David Pinnell of Upshur County. Um, he was appointed in the recall session of the Constitutional Convention uh, to fill a vacancy based on the resignation of Richard Brooks. Uh, he was a surgeon in the cavalry, which is pretty cool. This is James Paxton. He's going to be a delegate to the first and second conventions. He's going to be the chairman of the Finance and Taxation Committee. Um, here's Waitman T. Willie, my, my favorite. I love Waitman T. Willie. Um, I, he's from Montegalia County. Um, Willie Street in uh, Morgantown is named for Whitman T. Willie. His house is actually still in Morgantown to this day. Um, he is going to be a delegate to the Richmond Convention that voted to secede. Uh, he is going to be a dele delegate to the First Wheeling Convention and the Constitutional Convention. He'll be elected as U.S. Senator for the restored state of West Virginia. He is going to be the guy that writes the William Amendment, which helps get West Virginia to become a state. Um, basically, the more radical Republicans in um, the uh, Congress did not want to admit another slave state to the Union and so Willie will write a amendment which gives gradual emancipation to West Virginia slaves and so that will pass that'll be a compromise and then the citizens of West Virginia are gonna have to pass it so Willie rocks this is John Carlisle or as um, my niece and nephew call him the traitor he was like probably the most outspoken person um, for the West Virginia statehood movement. He's going to be elected to the U.S. Senate as well, and he will betray the state of West Virginia and turn his back on the statehood mo movement and try to stop it in the Congress. This is Thomas Hornbook. He was an aide to Governor Pierpont. He's also going to be the surveyor of Wheeling. Here's Governor Borman. He was from Parkersburg. He is going to be the first governor of the actual state of West Virginia. Um, and he, like Borman Elementary is named for him. Um, but he, he was an amazing human being. And if you like, if you're from Parkersburg or you go to Parkersburg, if you go like two blocks up the street from the Blennerhassett Hotel, that's where his house was in Parkersburg. And then here he is. Here's Demand. 
This is Francis Pierpont of Marion County. He's known as the father of West Virginia. He's going to be in the first and second Wheeling Conventions. He'll be elected governor of the restored state of Virginia, a position which he will hold until 1868. So I love these pictures. This is a wonderful thing to have here and willing to see. So we're going to show you the rest of this building and I hope that you love it. Hi y'all. Uh, we are now in the third floor courtroom of West Virginia Independence Hall. This was the U.S. Customs House and this was the U.S. District Court from where Ju uh, Justice John J. Jackson served and conducted business. And so it was in this space which was big enough for all the delegates as well as all of the people who were watching um, that the second wheeling convention where um, West Virginia voted to become a state uh, and where the constitutional convention, the constitution of the state of West Virginia is going to be written. Um, this space was remained, uh, painstakingly preserved in the 1960s. Um, and it is one of the most historically accurate buildings in um, all of the United States uh, because all of the molds for everything in here um, was, were preserved, um, all the architectural renderings, all the paintings, and so everything is absolutely like almost 100% accurate in this room. So you can come and stand and see what this room looked like in 1861, 1862, and then, of course, in the winter of 1863, when they vote to pass the Willie, Willie Amendment, um, and to see what this room actually looked like. I love that this room is lit by just lamp light, so you can see what it was like as you were in it. It wasn't, you know, super bright because we didn't have bright, you know, artificial light like we do today. And so you can see here. here benches for watching and then the windows if you look at the windows you can see the waves in the windows these are all hamblin windows uh, the window coverings are um, metal window coverings they are again created from the molds the original molds and at this time they've been using gas lights you can see they have um, replica gas lights so you can see what it looked like this wall has not been restored. This shows what was found under 15 layers of paint um, when they brought the building back to its original condition. And so this is what archeologists found after digging and going through 15 layers of paint. So there's a couple of cool signs that talk about the fact that this is going to be an actual courtroom for the federal district court from 1859 to 1863 in Virginia and then of course 1863 to 1907 in West Virginia and this image I love this this is from Harper's Weekly this was the front cover and this is uh, people in this room um, during the um, well this was from when they were you no know, I take that back 1861 so this would have been um, when they were deciding to create the restored state of Virginia because for the state of West Virginia to be created constitutionally um, Virginia had to be restored to the Union and give itself permission um, to secede and create a new state that's what's uh, laid out in article 4 section 3 of the US Constitution and then if you come over here gives us some facts about West Virginia statehood. It says West Virginia was the last slave state to enter the Union despite demands of Congress, especially the radical Republicans in Congress to abolish slavery entirely in the new state. Um, we are only going to have gradual emancipation, which is uh, part of the Willie Amendment. Whitman T. Willie will propose as a compromise. It says the immediate cause of the Civil War was the secession of southern states. And it says, ironically, the only successful secession of the war was the separation of West Virginia from Virginia. So that's the only change. Then, West Virginia, like I said, is the only change on the map brought about by the Civil War. The other state that will, could join the Union during the Civil War will be Nevada in 1864, but that is, you know, not because of the Civil War. 
And then it says the original statehood plan had only 39 West Virginia counties, uh, but then we're going to add them later to create a military barrier um, in southwestern West Virginia um, and going to include the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which um, the state of Virginia will sue West Virginia at the civil at end of the Civil War for money and to get back the state and get back counties. And the Supreme Court will rule in favor, U.S. Supreme Court will rule in favor of West Virginia because they wanted to protect the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad from falling into what was Confederate hands. Hello, we are now on the second floor of the U.S. Customs House, which is known as West Virginia Independence Hall, and we are in the actual office of the governor. And that first governor that is going to use this office is going to be Francis Pierpont of Marion County. Um, he was the governor of the restored state of Virginia. And you can see here, here's a picture. Uh, that's Borman, Arthur Borman, who's going to be the first governor of the state of West Virginia. And, of course, a picture of President Lincoln. Um, but this office is modeled like it looked when it was the office for Francis Pierpont. And so I love that. On the desk here, you can see copies of the T Daily Intelligencer, which was Archibald uh, Campbell's newspaper that was published here in Wheeling. And so um, that was not a newspaper that just, you know, circulated in the Wheeling area. It was a paper that spread all over Western Virginia. Uh, Wheeling had so much influence on what was going on in the rest of Western Virginia because Wheeling was on the Ohio River and on the National Road and on the B&O. And so that paper didn't just, was not just printed here and influenced what was happening here, but it influenced all of Western Virginia. People all over Western Virginia wanted to hear what was being published and said in the Wheeling Intelligencer. Um, so on June 20th, 1863, when West Virginia actually becomes a state, this office is going to transfer from Francis Pierpont to the first governor of West Virginia, um, Arthur Borman of Parkersburg in Wood County. So this office holds a lot of importance, um, a lot of, you know, memories in it because this is where Francis Pierpont labored to create the state of West Virginia and it's where Arthur Borman is going to guide those early years of West Virginia's history. All right, so we're in the restoration room here at the West Virginia Independence Hall and I wanted to show you what they went through to restore this building. So they began in 1965 restoring this building to its 1861 um, appearance. So it was 48 years of post office custom house and then sold into private hands in 1907. It had lots of functions including a bank, a business school, a restaurant, a liquor store, a barbershop, a nightclub, Hazel Atlas Glass, and a life insurance company. And they said that they built a portico and an extension onto the fourth floor. They built a fourth floor one. And so you couldn't even tell that this was the original building, what it actually looked like. So it's going to take lots of work to save this building because it was very dilapidated. They thought they were going to have to tear it down. So in 1981, it opened up as a museum. So you can see what it looked like at one time. And then you can see all this restoration work that's going to have to go into saving this building. And so one of the reasons why they were able to put this building back to its original use and original look is we have all of the reproductions of what the actual molds look like that were used in this building. Um, everything was saved. It was meticulously preserved. Um, they have all the schematics. They have all of these molds. They have all the drawings and images. You can go look up them. They're on the Library of Congress website. Very, very cool. And so here's some, some of what these things look like. This is one of the renderings from the 1960s and 70s of how they were going to fix the building. So, but these original drawings here, um, you can look at online in the Library of Congress's webpage. And then, I love this. This is one of the original frescoes that they discovered, and so they were able to preserve it here so that we could look it up on it at the wall. And then here, this is one of the plaster patterns that they used even. Um, just really neat. So this building, you know, it's not just a monument to West Virginia statehood. It's a monument to Wheeling, West Virginia, to um, ingenuity, know-how, um, and to all the people of West Virginia. So 
I, I love this place, and part of it is because of all the love and honor that was put into building this place and to restoring it. Because West Virginia was born uh, during the Civil War, the only state to be born of another state during the Civil War, um, one of the displays here on the second floor is of actual battle flags that were carried during the Civil War. So we're going to show those to you. Um, and they have been painstakingly preserved in here. So here is one of those battle flags. Um, this was carried by the 5th West Virginia Cavalry. And here are some of the gentlemen that were in this. And you can see where they served, that they were young soldiers from three uh, states, from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, in particular, Wood, Ritchie, Tyler, Wetzel, and Marshall counties. And they saw action in, at McDowell, the Battle of McDowell, Floyd's Mountain, New River Bridge, Lynchburg. And so this battle flag, you can see here, this is the history of it. Um, it was purchased for $110. It was adorned with metal temps and an ornament, and it was purchased after the regiment's main engagements. So it has been painstakingly preserved here. Here's another one. This is from the 1st Artillery. It's another battle flag. Um, and so they were mostly from, it says, um, Ohio County, organized, organized here in Wheeling. Um, it says it looks like a cavalry uh, guide on, um, but it is from Battery D of the Artillery. And so it had 34 stars, so we know that it was pr pr made before 1863 when um, uh, West Virginia became a state. Um, this is my favorite one right here. Um, she's beautiful. This is from the 8th West Virginia Infantry. And you can see it's hand painted on a um, silk background. And so it says it was hand sewn, likely carried into battle and was replaced when the regiment became the 7th Cavalry in 1864. So, and you can see some of the places these men were from. And so this one is really um, important to me because I had an ancestor. It was in um, the West Virginia 7th from Jackson County. Actually more than one ancestor. So you can see here some of their actions. They were at Cross Keys, Second Bull Run, Rocky Gap, and they were at the Battle of Drew Mountain. So um, this is part of my history and heritage um, right here of my ancestors. This is, you know, James Madison Buckley, babe. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is, he was in this, in this mm -hmm. group right here. So my great, great, great grandfather marched under that actual flag. Okay, here's another one. This is the 7th West Virginia Cavalry. It's another similar flag in similar condition. Um, and they were also from our part of the, uh, part of the world. So Mason, Jackson, Putnam, Clay, Kanawha, Cabell, Boone, Logan, Raleigh, Wyoming. And you can see where they were fighting as well. And that more died of disease than in action. Do you see that? 203 mm -hmm. died of disease, 33 died in action. And I want to make a quick note on these maps, by the way, because of the Civil War, there are only 50 counties oh, in yes. what West Virginia is considered That's important right now. because we're going to divide these two in half. Um, so like... Kind of. The hoot of it is, so for example, like um, Hardy and um, Grant. Grant County, um, the more southern sympathizing folks in what was Hardy County lived in what will become Grant County, which they named mm -hmm. for Ulysses S. Grant, just to make right. those people mad. Logan is going to be one big county because <coughs> Mingo is not a county here yet. And of course, the big contingency there between Kanawha and Cabell counties, uh, Lincoln County has not been formed nope. yet. Southern part of the state, Raleigh, Mercer, Monroe, and, and Greenbrier, they still have not formed uh, Summers County yet yeah. either. So. Yeah, which Summers County is named for someone that we've talked about today. Um, so here's another one. This is gorgeous. This is 7th West Virginia Infantry. Here we go. Um, and you can see some of the folks that serve with them. They're going to be at Antietam. I mean, they're at the biggest battles of the whole stinking war. So they're at Antietam, at Gettysburg, at Fredericksburg. And, of course, and they're going to be at Appomattox when Lee surrenders. So, I mean, that flag is just... Look, 
Borman, it says Borm, Arthur I. Borman himself paid and presented this flag to the 7th Infantry, commemorating the many battles in which this regiment had distinguished itself. I've been to their monument um, at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. So this is so fantastic. These flags have been preserved here. Oh, look, they were also at Chancellorsville, Dave. I mean, when you think of the big battles, you think of Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg. Well, and of course, you know, Vicksburg and some others, but they were there and they were in the thick of it. So this is the first West Virginia Cavalry. They were also at Gettysburg. They were also um, at the surrender um, in Antietam. Uh, not Antietam, but Appomattox, sorry. So, and they're mostly from Marion, Montegalia, and Preston counties. So beautiful. And then here's another one. This is the second West Virginia Cavalry. And you can see here, um, some of the places they fought were Sinking Creek, Lynchburg, Winchester, Battle of Winchester, and at, they were also at Appomattox as well. I love this. This flag is so beautifully preserved. So that Battle of Hurricane Bridge, Virginia, that is in Putnam County, that, that battle. So, and these gentlemen were recruited from Canal Cabell in Mason County. And so then you can see there, because Hurricane, Bridge, Hurricane right there. Bridge right there on the map, that's where Hurricane is today. They call that too, like the Battle of Scary Creek, right? Isn't that the other terminology they, they use for it? Hurricane Bridge or the Battle of Scary Creek is what I've always heard. So, um, yeah beautiful flag be a beautifully preserved flag plus look look at the stone you've got the state seal by joseph de his de bar here so you've got the stone with june 20th 1863 you've got the farmer and the miner and you can see there the blacksmith iron and then of course your cross guns montanai semper liberi and then you've got your fajiri cap right here which um my Fellow James Madison fellows who um, know me well, we, we, we look for Fijian caps everywhere we go. Um, so here's another one. This is from the 13th West Virginia Infantry. And you can see where these folks were from. They were from Mason, Cabell, and Kanawha. They were also at Hurricane um, Bridge. They were in Lynchburg and they fought down in the Shenandoah Valley. I'm assuming that's during Sheridan's march because, like, um, when Sherman was marching to the sea in Georgia, Sheridan was marching through the Shenandoah Valley and um, doing the same thing, destroying anything of value. And then off oh, this one, Dave. Beautiful. So this is the 3rd West Virginia Infantry, and you can see here they were at McDowell, Cross Keys, Waterloo, 2nd Bull Run, and they were also at Droop. Um, over in Pocahontas County, which you can see here. Look at the dots. They just right there to Droop. Droop is the last major battle to happen in what will be West Virginia. So here's the 4th West Virginia Infantry. So as it points out importantly, this flag we know is pre June 20th, 1863 because it only has 34 stars. Does it use some much use likely in battle? It suggests this flag was carried at Vicksburg down in Mississippi, which was of course an important campaign um, that allowed the Union forces to um, take control of the Mississippi River. And so of course that was one of the key aims of the Anaconda Plan was for the North or the Union to control the Mississippi River. We've got a couple more flags for you. This is a nice with West Virginia infantry. Um, and these people are mostly recruited out of Cabell. Man, Cabell's shaped weird. Um, Remember, no Lincoln County at the yeah, time. Yeah, it's so weird to look at it. My brain just can't even process it. Um, so then you've got later battles for these folks, including Cloyd's Mountain, Lynchburg, Kernstown, and Third Winchester. Of course, Winchester, right south of Martinsburg. This, this flag only has 34 uh, stars as well. Um, we think it was not present at Coy's Mountain or in, uh, Lynchburg, but it had action and a minia ball had buried itself halfway through the staff. 
So we know it was in battle. It had bat uh, bullets in it. And then this is a Confederate flag. Um, and it was captured at the Battle of Lynchburg. Um, and you can see here what it looked like pre-conservation and post-conservation. I'm really so glad that they preserved these. Um, and you can hear the humming. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but this room, these flags have like air flowing through them for preservation purposes. They ensure that they keep a steady temperature so that they're preserved. Um, it used to be these things were not in a state of preservation like this. And so this room is extremely special because of all of the time and money that was put in to preserve these flags for future generations of West Virginians so that they can come and see a tangible piece of our state's Civil War history. So we are now um, with the statue uh, Lincoln Walks at Midnight. The original of the statue stands um, overlooking the West Virginia State Capitol and the Canal River down in Charleston. But there is a second one that's here. I love this statue. And so we wanted to share with you, this is Harlow. We wanted Hi. to share with you Lincoln's words on West Virginia statehood. Um, her social studies fair project with her brother is about West Virginia statehood. So she's gonna read you what President Lincoln had to say in December of 1862. What does he have to say, Harlow? That the vision of a state is judged as a precedent, but the measure made expedient by war is no precedent for times of peace. It's said that the admission of West Virginia, West Virginia is secession and tolerated only because it is our secession. Well, if we can call it by that name, there is still difference enough between Secession against the Constitution and secession in favor of the Constitution. I believe that the I believe the admission of West Virginia into the Union is expedient. And so do we. Um, this is their social studies fair topic, so that's why we've come to Wheeling. And so um, there's a lot more to see here. We did not show you even half of this museum um, because we want you to come to Wheeling. You need to bring your kids. You need to bring your family members. You need to actually stand in history and walk the same halls that our founding fathers walked and our founding mothers. And so those people that were strong proponents of the West Virginia statehood movement were patriots. They were the patriots of a, of a second American Revolution. And so we're really glad that we got to come here and see this. Did you love this? Yeah. Yeah, they've been really into this topic for a long time, so we came to see this, and we will definitely, definitely be back. But we wanted to share Lincoln's words with you, um, and we'll show you outside here in a few minutes. Hey, y'all. We are now outside of West Virginia Independence Hall, and I wanted to show you the sign here on the front of the building. Um, every June 20th, um, they open these front doors and have a huge celebration out here to celebrate West Virginia's birthday. Um, this year is going to be especially um, eventful because they're going to be dedicating a new statue to the first president or the first governor of West Virginia, Arthur Borman. And so uh, we're right in downtown Wheeling. If you look like right here across the street, there's the Wheeling Intelligencer newspaper office. So just right here down the street from um, the building. I also wanted to show you all that this building has been designated a National Historic Landmark. It possesses national significance in commemorating the history of the United States of America. And that was denoted in 1988 by the National Park Service. And then of course, um, there is this lovely, West Virginia historical marker. We know we love the West Virginia historical markers. And so, you see, yep, it's the same on each side. So this one denotes that this was the U.S. Customs House. It was built by federal architect Ami B. Young for use as the Customs House in 1856 through 1859 at a cost of $96,918. The convention met here in 1861 that helped set the state for the West Virginia statehood. They also wrote West Virginia's first constitution in this building upstairs. And Arthur Borman, who was the first governor of West Virginia and other officials 
were had their offices here. So both Francis Pierpont, who we consider the father of the state of West Virginia, who is going to be the governor of the restored state, and Arthur Borman had their offices in this building. So we're going to conclude by showing you this massive statue of one of my heroes, Francis Pierpont, here at the corner. And so here he is, Francis Pierpont and all his glory. Francis Pierpont, Francis A. Pierpont of Marion County, governor of the restored government of Virginia from 1861 to 1868. And so there's going to be a companion piece installed in June. It's going to be the Borman statue for Arthur Borman. And then here's a, a Pierpont quote. Lose not your sacred liberties. Never abandon that flag. Never yield to the rights of free men. And so um, you can see here the sculptor, Gareth Curtis in 2015. Um, I'm so excited for the Borman statue. Borman's, Borman's one of my favorites. So you definitely need to come to Wheeling, need to visit Independence Hall, because as we were talking about earlier, you're, you're not going to regret this trip and you're always going to come here and learn something new. So thank you for joining us here on West Virginia History with Mrs. B. I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope that you'll come out the Wheeling and learn about our state of history. Thanks y'all for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to West Virginia History with Mrs. B on both Facebook and YouTube.